big announcement today. I think it's the only one in your bulletin is that this evening we're going to do Madison Olympics at Landis Park. And so that'll be a lot of fun. And uh, just uh, the Olympics can be kind of intimidating. I know when I watch the Olympics, they certainly seem like events that I would not be able to compete in successfully. Uh, maybe speed walking, uh, but that's probably it. And, um, but I want you to know that Madison Olympics are going to be a little different, right? There will be all kinds of different skills that you can use to win an event. And not all of them require you to be athletically skilled or uh, quick on your feet or very agile. Uh, there are some events where that might help. So if you want to do that and try, it would be fun. But there are some events where a lot of it will be up to chance or be up to something very silly. And uh, so I wanted to kind of illustrate this for you so that you're not intimidated uh, about coming to Madison Olympics tonight and competing in an event. I want to show you that these events can often be won just if you're lucky. Okay? So I'm going to show you a game that is like some of the ones we might play at Madison Olympics. And I'm going to get some help from uh, Joseph here. Oh, Joseph, come up with me, buddy. Jack. Can you help me get ready? And uh, so Joseph and I are going to play a little game like ones we might play at Madison Olympics. I'm going to have to get ready here because it could get a little messy. So I'm going to set up a towel here. And again, this is all to illustrate that at the Madison Olympics, oftentimes you can be a champion just by being lucky. Jack's going to grab a container here that has something special in it. Joseph, why don't you go ahead and take a seat? That's good. All right. Look good. Okay. Joseph and I are actually going to be competing against each other. I need to protect my microphone, so I'll talk up a little here. Jack Smith has six eggs, and five of them are hard boiled. <laughs> and uh, so the champion of this event is the one who does not pick a hard boiled egg. We will take turns grabbing an egg and cracking it on our head until we determine a winner. And Joseph, I'm going to let you go first. <laughs> Get first. There you go. Okay. Alright. Jack, I need to pick an egg here. This one looks lucky. Okay. So. I swear there was only one raw egg in there. So congratulations, Joseph. <laughs> you are the champion gold medalist at the very first opening event of the Madison Olympic Games 2017. <laughs> the Olympics are at 6.30 tonight in Landis Park. Uh, there's just going to be desserts and snacks there, and we'll play games, some of them like this one where you don't need any skill or talent, you just need to be willing to crack an egg on your head and see if you win. Go ahead. What's that? It's going to be at Landis Park or BGM? It's going to be at Landis Park. And so uh, it was going to be at BGM for a while, but we moved it over to the park. There are some better places to sit down over there. And so we'll do that. And just want to make sure we got it on the slide. Oh, yeah. OK. It is at Landis Park at 630. And so, those are announcements. Why don't you go ahead and stand as we sing this morning, would you?
Good morning to everyone. I'm glad to see all of you here. To our guests and visitors, we say thank you for coming and spending an hour of worship with us this morning. We hope you find it enjoying and will return. Uh, on our list, we have uh, many on our list as we do each week. I've got several updates and a few ones to be added. Uh, first of all, Judy Matthews, who we've been praying for for a long time, is uh, back at the Brooklyn Nursing Home. Uh, she has lost 10 pounds of fluid. And obviously when that happens, you have to feel a whole lot better. And she does. So we pray for healing for her, continue good health. Uh, this uh, September 1st, she's gonna turn 75 years old. And uh, her birthday, uh, Sherry said she'd like to have a card shower for her. So I don't know if it's in the paper, but just word of mouth that she would appreciate very much use uh, sending her a birthday card and just send the cards to the nursing home, Sherry said. Uh, an update on Max Hall, which I think we all know. Uh, Friday, he had three and a half hour surgery on his heart and he had four bypasses. He is in ICU, he was to be in ICU for 24 to 48 hours. I was told this morning by Joel that he is doing fantastic. So that is great. Uh, when he gets back on the seventh floor in cardiac unit, then he can have visitors. So our prayers go out to him also for what he's had to endure and obviously much more to endure, but with God's help, he will heal. In, your, in uh, the bulletin you got, you had a guy by the name of Jack Nielsen, who's having hernia surgery, I believe it was, Joel, wasn't it? That is not our little Jack here. <laughs> it's his great-grandfather, Joel's dad. Uh, he had hip surgery. Uh, he was 85, like I said, and he's doing very well. So we continue to pray for him and uh, the healing that will take place. Joel told me he's a magnificent man that heals easily. <laughs> so we still need to pray for him. A couple others that have been handed to me. Uh, Marla Crawford asked me to pray for her brother-in-law, Don Lincoln. I'm not certain where he's from. Marla, could you tell me, is he from Grinnell or? I'm sorry? Oh, from North Dakota. A little ways away, but we can still keep him in our prayers. He's been in the hospital one week with a blood poisoning. I've never had it. I don't know much about it, but I know it's not good. Uh, they are hoping to clear this up, and then uh, they think he possibly has cancer. So they're getting this cleared up so they can treat his cancer. So we pray for healing and recovery for him as well. Many of you probably know Jana Stoker from Grinnell. I was just handed this this morning. Uh, she has breast cancer. I think everybody knows Jana, and uh, she's having surgery and then radiation. I don't know the time frame of when all this will happen, but that's when on what is on her schedule. So please lift up Jana in your prayers as well. Uh, Brady's dad, Dave Erickson, is leaving on a mission trip to Myanmarra, and I'm sure I mispronounced that, but over there, Brady said there's only 4% Christians, so it's going to be tough, but he's going to help train some local church leaders, so please lift him up as he travels, as he's over there on his return home. I think Brady maybe said a couple weeks, but it'll be some time anyway over there. Uh, then we're the only individuals that I have. Is there any request here uh, for praises or for others that we need to pray for? I have yes. Okay, if you didn't hear, uh, Russ and Tammy Greer from Grinnell was in a bad motorcycle accident uh, four weeks ago or three. Hurt very bad, and they're recovering well from what I understand. Uh, the worst of the two was, was Tammy, and she's recovering well. So continue to pray for them each and every day as you do all these others as well. Uh, the only other ones I have down that I thought of was the hurricane that's happened down in Texas, Hurricane, hurricane Harvey. I have not been up to date on it lately in the last 24 hours. I know it was a bad scene down there. When they rated it as a 
Category 4, that's not good. We know what destruction can be. I don't know if death has occurred. I don't know what's happening exactly now, but they need our prayers just as much as everybody else. We've all been affected by storms, obviously not hurricanes, fire, many things that's taken our home, and it's devastating. It takes a chunk out of you. So we could pray for all of them that have lost either loved ones, I'll pray for anyone here that has relation or family down there. We just ask for uh, healing for them as well. We also pray today for Joel's message that he delivers to us. May we have our eyes open, our ears to listen, and our heart to accept what he's about to say. Them are all that I have. Uh, is there any others that would uh, care to speak up at this time? Hearing or seeing none, uh, we'll go to God. Again, as you know me well, I like quiet time. I think it's time for us all to bow our heads and in your own words and thoughts, put what you want to bring to God today. And then when I, for after a short time, I will close with prayer then. Let us pray. Lord, this day we come to you with praises and also for, ask for healing in our minds and our bodies and our souls. It has been said that if two or more are gathered, you will hear our prayers. We know you hear our prayers each and every time we talk to you, whether it be out loud or within our hearts. I'm not gonna list everyone that was mentioned, but you know their needs their wants and their desires. And healing comes through you, through your son Jesus, who died on a cross for us all. I pray for each one that was mentioned today. I pray also for the ones that were unspoken, spoken to you in thoughts and prayers. Please be with us this coming week. Guide us, give us direction, give us the wisdom and knowledge that comes only from you and through you. We ask all these things in your son's Jesus' name. Amen. Would you continue singing with us this morning?
Good morning. Um, this morning as we uh, prepare our hearts for receiving the Lord's Supper and the Communion, um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, read a couple of scriptures here. And uh, It was very interesting when we were talking about, uh, well, what Joel's message will be today and some of the thought processes we were going through. I uh, was going my, I was starting to look through my Bible, and I found this meditation I'd written a long time ago, and how it fit with everything we're going to be talking about today. So it's like, well, that was easy. <laughs> but uh, I just revised it a little bit. Um, you know, we're going to be talking a little bit about... <clears throat> Joel doesn't have any trouble. He doesn't carry as much material as I do, I guess. But uh, at any rate, uh, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about truth in a, some in suffering and stuff, but uh, speaking of the truth, we, I wanted to go back to uh, the Gospel of John. We we'll start there, and in John chapter fourteen, um, it's kind of a familiar verse if you uh, if you know if you know what this you read it. But um, I'm going to read this uh, for you one through six in chapter fourteen. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me also. In my Father's house are many rooms or mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come back and take you to be with me, and there you'll be with me also. You know the way to the place where I am going. Now, I'm going to stop here for just a second. I'm going to interject something. How many of you have been told that you know what to do and then don't do it? Or you don't even understand it? Well, the disciples or the apostles had that same issue. Thomas then turns around and he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how are we going to know the way to get there? And then the, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So with that scripture in mind, I come to this that I had written a long time ago. And it still holds true today. And that's the nice thing about, about us as human beings. We think we're gaining. We think we're growing beyond things. But you know what? We still have the same thought processes that have gone throughout all time. We have the same issues. We have the same problems. But in our world today, we've got many who that claim they have the knowledge and they are messengers of God. They claim that they want our attention. They want our money. Their messages may differ, not only in the theology that Jesus is the Son of God, but that there are many ways to get to heaven. They deny the validity of the Bible. Now, I'm not going to address all these things. However, there was one issue that we need to be concerned about. That's the regard about the claim that the Bible is invalid. Well, if someone does that, you know they're lying. Because in, first, or in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says that all scriptures God breathed. And it's good for instruction and correction in righteousness. So, that then becomes a lie. Now, in order to answer the claim that Jesus is not the Son of God, but only a man, and that there are many ways to the eternal life, we need to point out in 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. And I'm going to read, uh, starting in, let's see, I'm going to start in verse 1, I think. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. That every spirit acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is not the spirit of God, but it is the spirit of the Antichrist. You have heard that it's been coming, and it is even now here. 
Well, <clears throat> there are times that I really believe that, that the Antichrist spirit has been with us for all time, but it seems like sometimes it's getting worse. So, who is it then that overcomes the world and overcomes this uh, sin that's in the world? And there we have uh, the answer to that is also Scripture. It's in 1 first, first John chapter 5. It says in verse 5, Who is it that overcomes the world? And it's only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, we all here, as we gather around this table, we as one collective mind accept that fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is God. He died on our behalf, and we accept his sacrifice on our behalf. doesn't mean that we're perfect. doesn't mean that we will be. It just means that we constantly seek him, as we talked about this morning in class. So I want to conclude with this. 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 17, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, that Christ Jesus might be, dis be on display and also might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who believe on him and receive eternal life. So with that, I say this, that if you confess that Jesus Christ is your Savior, and that he's the Son of God, then you are welcome at this table. If you bow with me in word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you for that patience, for the understanding, and for the grace that's found through Jesus Christ. This morning, as we partake of these emblems, we recognize the body that was broken on our behalf. We recognize the blood that was shed in order to wash away the sin. We ask your forgiveness for the times that we do fall short of your glory, which you call sin. Give us the strength each and every day to seek after you and to keep, keep you held up. It's all these things we lift up in Jesus' name. Amen.
into our lives just by your presence. Ask you, Lord, for your blessings over all of all of the possessions we have that we can share. Lord, we do ask you that our lives would be a sacrifice to you that's pleasing and a beautiful aroma, a fragrance that you accept. In Jesus' name. Yeah, I know. Go on. This week we're uh, going to be continuing on in Second Timothy. We'll be looking at chapter three. So if you want to open there, the, you'd have a head start. And I, I might need your help because it's kind of a cloudy morning, and I know like my kids look worn out and tired and they're quiet, but there's also something else going on right now in our, our portion of Iowa is it's cricket season, okay? So they are everywhere, and there are some in the baptismal. I don't know if they are repentant or not, well, but they're back there, and so you guys are going to have to uh, keep this place alive, make a little noise. Maybe, Jack and Henry, you can help me out this morning so I don't hear any of those crickets while I'm talking. It's just a little disheartening, you know. Um, we're going to be looking at Second Timothy chapter 3, and it's a chapter that divides pretty neatly into halves. Uh, the, uh, the book of Second Timothy that we've been talking about is a book written in the midst of pain. It's written from Paul this guy who is in prison, he's about to face execution, he's having a really hard time, and he's writing to Timothy. Timothy is not having a very good time either, okay? He's facing betrayal and heresy in the church in Ephesus, and Paul even says that everybody there in the province of Asia, everybody around Timothy has turned their backs on Paul, and it's bringing him down. And so they're, it, Paul is instructing Timothy on how to get through it. And that's, that's why we're looking at this book, because a lot of times we encounter those challenges and hard times in our lives, and we have to know, how do we get through that? How do we deal with the pain that our life often brings us, that our world often brings us? And I told you that chapter 3 divides pretty neatly into halves. The first half is verses 1 through 9. Uh, if you'll remember that last week, we talked about peace in the midst of pain, and how Timothy needed to uh, dispatch of the arguments and quarrels that he would get into. He needed to be gentle and instruct gently and not be resentful to, um, to the people who he is instructing. And we learned that uh, here with each other that we needed to dispense of arguments and quarrels and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with all those who call on God out of a pure heart, that we need to do that together. This week, the tone is going to be a little different. As we turn to chapter 3, uh, Paul has some very harsh words for false teachers. We're going to start in chapter uh, 3, verse 1. It says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. And that is a long list. I count 19 descriptions in that list of the people who Paul is talking about, and here he's telling us who they are, okay? He's giving us qualities of people that Timothy needs to avoid, all right, and uh, he introduces this list with with the uh, with a phrase that there will be terrible times in the last days. That can often throw us off. You shouldn't think of the last days as some uh, terrible event that awaits us in the future, but oftentimes in the Bible, as we see, uh, in, we read this in Second Peter as well. the The Bible will refer to the last days as a period in between Jesus' first appearance and his second coming. Okay. And so the last days often refers to this whole span of time that now has gone on for, for almost 2,000 years in between when Jesus first came, he died, uh, rose from the dead and ascended, and between when Christ returns again, that those are the last days. 
that we are living in the last days. And Paul promises that people of a certain character will come in that time. And then he lists 19 things. And um, some things we need to understand about this list is that it is not a binary checklist, okay, but a holistic depiction of character. Uh, If we were to avoid and uh, expel anybody who did one of the things in this list, then it would be an empty building this morning. I would, be, I would lead the pack out of the door, <laughs> okay? And uh, so, the, obviously, nobody goes through life without doing one of these things. Uh, sometimes I make it through a day. I can't make it through a day without being uh, brutal <laughs> or rash. I'm sure you can relate. And so it doesn't matter if... Uh, when we read this list, we can't say, oh, well, I'm looking at this person and they, had, they check one of these boxes, so I, I should avoid them. Or they check two of these boxes. Or they check five of these boxes, so I should avoid them. But this is a picture of a person who is rebellious. I think the key item in the list is the way it starts. Lovers of self. They're lovers of self. This is because it follows on the heels of Paul's instruction to Timothy to seek peace with everybody, to be gentle and kind there in the, in the verses we read in chapter 2 last week. And so the opposite of that pursuit are the descriptions that he gives here of who they are. They are lovers of themselves. And all these various transgressions, all these various bad qualities, the, the next 18 all kind of fit under that category, they are a violation of the rule of peace and purity that we discussed. At play here is the issue of this line that we talked about last week. You remember that uh, there's there's a line out there somewhere, and on the left-hand side of that line, uh, among us, we are to behave with um, gentleness, with love and forgiveness and peace. We are to not be resentful, but to instruct gently. And, but there is a line where one can go too far. We talked last week about uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus. They went over the line because they denied, uh, or they said that the resurrection had already taken place. They denied that there would be a resurrection at the last day. And uh, that, that put them outside of the church, outside of the circle of people that we, uh, that we treat with kindness and forgiveness. This week, Paul's description begins with lovers of themselves. People who occupy this character described by these 19 qualities are people who Timothy is to avoid. Paul moves on here. uh, After he describes who it is they are, the next few verses describe what it is that they do. So we'll return to the text starting in verse 6. It says, they are the kind who worm their way into homes. That's a fun picture. They worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. We'll pause there. And and I need to look at something here. So these false teachers, again, I I still think that Paul is talking about this group of people who are denying the resurrection Okay, and causing trouble in Ephesus, it says they worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women. That's an interesting way to put it. And you have to ask here, why is Paul picking on women? I don't think this is a, this is a condemnation of a gender. Uh, but Paul is saying that these false teachers in Ephesus had, uh, had tricked women, had pulled them astray. And the unfortunate truth is that uh, in this moment, at this historical occasion, the way that uh, these teachers had gained popularity, the way these teachers had gained a foothold in the church is by deceiving a number of women. It also says that uh, these teachers were always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. That is something we'll look at as we go on. Continuing on, Scripture says, starting in verse 7, it says, Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. They're on the right side of the line. 
but they will not get very far because as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Jonathan Jombrace is a little confusing. Uh, if you're a Bible scholar, then that won't give you any advantage in figuring out who Jonathan Jombrace are. They, they don't appear in the Old Testament. You need to know that they're uh, in extra biblical literature, in Jewish history, uh, they uh, recorded the names of Pharaoh's magicians during the time of the ten plagues. So you remember, this is actually a screenshot from the uh, Charlton Heston version of Moses, and that when Moses drops his staff and it turns into a, um, turns into a snake, that Pharaoh's magicians are able to do the same thing, that they drop their staffs and they turn into snakes as well. And uh, Moses' snake was a little better because he ate their snake, um, but still, uh, Pharaoh had magicians who were deceiving the people, saying, sure, God can do those things, but look, my magicians can do special things too. And uh, in Jewish history, at least in folklore, their names were recorded as Jonas and Jambres. And Paul says that the people uh, that he described with those 19 qualities, and the people uh, like Hymenaeus and Philetus that he described in, um, in chapter 2, who were denied the resurrection, were like these false magicians who are leading people astray. Again, I want, to, I want to return and ask you to think about verse 7, which I think is a really important part of this passage where Paul uh, is describing what these false teachers do. And said, uh, there he says, again, that they were always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Truth becomes a central feature of 2 Timothy's teaching to us about how we are to live in the midst of pain about how we are to overcome pain and struggles in our life. The truth is extremely important. It is in this passage we will learn to pursue truth in the midst of pain. We will learn that that becomes an anchor on with, onto which we can hold when we're going through tough times, especially when we're going in through, uh, through tough times because of the evil done to us by other people. To introduce this idea of truth being so important, I want to tell you a story uh, from when I was younger. Actually, uh, two stories. So first, I'll tell you, uh, one time I was in high school, and uh, I have three sisters, one of which is two and a half years younger than me. Her name is Maggie, and she is a genius, <laughs> certifiable genius. Uh, and so she was in junior high, I believe, at this time, and she was already starting to display the fact that she was smarter than us. Uh, which um, made what I'm about to tell you even more enjoyable. Um, she's a doctor now in Wichita. She's a big show off. And um, Maggie decided that she was going to make a frozen pizza. And she began to make the frozen pizza. And uh, soon after, smoke started coming out of the oven. And uh, I, it wasn't a fire, but Maggie had put the pizza on a plastic tray. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I remember my dad running to the oven and opening it, smoke billowing out, and just seeing this plastic draping down off of the rack and, and settling on the bottom of the oven, and it was, it was very black, and it was dark, and I, and I just remember really enjoying the fact that my genius sister had put a plastic tray <laughs> in the oven. But the most important thing about this moment is I remember we had all gathered in the kitchen to see what was going on because it was extremely uh, fascinating, a lot of drama. And, um, but I remember, even though there was no fire, I remember my dad pulling us all aside and looking at us and said, kids, you need to remember something really important, that whenever there's a fire in the kitchen, you can't put it out with water. No matter what happens, don't put out a fire in the kitchen with water. And that stuck with me. I remembered that. We're going to fast forward to when I was a little bit older. At the age of 20, uh, I was uh, engaged to a beautiful young lady by the name of Marky Sander. And, uh, and Marky was actually living in La Vista, Nebraska, not, not far away from where I was in Papillion, and uh, sharing an apartment with one Brianna Lang, then engaged to Brady Erickson. And... Um, I remember that Marky and I decided that uh, we were a little too poor to go out to eat, so we are going to try cooking, which was a new venture for me. 
I think probably for both of us, it's fair to say. And, um, and, but I was, I was going to take charge here, so we went to the grocery store and was like, okay, where do we start? <laughs> and I remember thinking, well, I like stir-fry. I saw a bottle of stir-fry sauce. It had directions for how to make stir-fry in the back. And, and so I thought, I can just do this. So I got the stir-fry and the vegetables and the beef and the sauce, I mean, and I took it home and I began to read the directions to prepare stir-fry. Well, that, that's awful small. You can't read it, but... Uh, those are some stir-fry, that's a stir-fry recipe up there. And the very first step is to put oil in a pan and put it on high heat. And uh, I remember on this bottle, it was put so much oil in a pan, put it on high heat, and then add thinly sliced beef. So I put the oil in the pan, I turned the heat on high, and then I went over to the counter and I began to slice the beef. Now I had I never touched a knife in the kitchen before, and so I just butchered this cut of meat, I'm certain, but it took a long time, too. And I remember Marky coming in the kitchen and saying, I don't think that oil should be black. <laughs> and so I reached over to turn off the burner, but even as I did, it combusted. And so I have big fire, maybe 12, 18 inches of fire coming out of this pan. I had no clue what to do, but I remembered that I couldn't put it out with water. You know what happens to a grease fire that you put out with water? It's not good, all right? I could have done a lot of damage that day. Uh, so I wasn't quite sure with what to do. I knew that I couldn't do that. <laughs> That's what happens when you put out a grease fire with water. Uh, so I picked up this pan. I had no idea what to do with it, and I, I handed it to Marky, and I went into the living room. <laughs> That's true. I did that. And uh, so I was uh, brainstorming out there. I realized... Well, there's a, there's a porch. They were on the second floor. There were a bunch of people in the living room. Were you there, Brianna? Yeah. You were there. Okay, Brianna was in the living room. Okay. And uh, I remember opening the door for the screen, or opening the door for the porch. And uh, I went back and got the pan. It was snowy outside. I was just going to go throw it off of the balcony. So I grabbed, I got the pan back from Marky, still on fire. And I went to go run out onto the balcony and throw it over the rail. And I ran straight into the screen door. <laughs> I had forgotten to open the screen door. It knocked me backwards onto my butt. I spilled burning oil onto the carpet, and I ruined a good patch of it there. And, uh, but the pan was still on fire, so I had to shake, up, shake off the cobwebs and open the screen door and throw it outside, and eventually just went out. And uh, so that was the story of my first cooking escapade. Who wants to come over for lunch? Uh, and, uh, but it was really important for me in that moment to remember something really important that my dad had told me. Now, I'm sure that after he told me not to put it out with water, he told me how to put it out. I didn't remember that part. It would have been pretty helpful. <laughs> uh, and uh, as I was preparing this message, I was thinking about Caitlin and Amy who, are le who have left for college. I think I think somebody should call them and tell them not to put out grease fires with water. Uh, we might do that later. The message that my dad gave me was so important. It could have saved, I don't know if it would have saved my life, it could have saved uh, the integrity, structural integrity of that apartment building. <laughs> it saved me from a lot of trouble. Paul is going to do something similar for Timothy here, or at least encourage him in truth. We're going to continue on uh, in 2 Timothy 3. You can find this passage on the inside of your bulletin. This is the second half of the chapter now. It says, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have been become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work.
Paul was telling Timothy that the truth is the antidote for heretics and arguments, for discord and disunity, that the truth would be the anchor that could see him through all of this. In our pain, in our life when we encounter hard circumstances, we need something to fall back on. We've talked about how uh, Christian friendship, loyal, faithful friendship will be helpful in that regard. We've talked about how understanding where God is and how he relates to evil and suffering in our world helps us understand and deal with that pain and see our way through. Paul encourages Timothy here to know the truth, to not be like the, the, the heretics, the people with, those, with all those bad qualities who are always learning and never understand the truth, but to know the truth. The truth that we know primarily comes from God's Word. We see Paul discuss it here. He says, And from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, it's helpful for us. That's what we do here every week. We learn and remember the scriptures. We rehearse them in our mind and we understand what they say. That is the truth that provides for us an anchor. But more at issue here in this passage is the idea of who the truth came from. Because it is a competition of character in this passage. There were competing parties wanting people to believe them and believe their teaching in Ephesus. There was Paul's message of the gospel, Christ uh, resurrected, descended from David, and there were, then there were the false teachers, false teachers like Hymenaeus and Philetus who denied the resurrection and, and had all those bad qualities that we read about earlier. And Paul says, look at them, look at all the bad things that they do, look at the poor way they behave. Are you going to believe them? Are you going to let people believe them? But then Paul says, in the beginning of the passage we just read, he goes through his own character. But look at me. He says, look at the things that that I do, my faith, patience, love, endurance. Look at all the things I've suffered through. And he says, believe me instead, because you know the one whom you've learned this from. When we look at this passage Uh, it is apparent to me that not only that we need truth to make it through hard times, that we need the truth of Scripture and God's Word to help us through that, but also that we need to be the faithful teachers of truth to those in our midst. This is a special place. It's a special place because people for generations and generations have taught the truth. And many of you are here today because you know the people who taught you those true things, and you've seen their character, you've seen the way that they loved you, you've seen the way that they loved their family, you've seen the way that they treated each other, and you knew that what they said was true because of the character that you saw in them. That burden is a burden that each generation carries, and each of us now have the responsibility to have that character and to have that mission of passing on this truth. I, look, I think back to my experience in the church and I think of all the people who weren't related to me and uh, had uh, no special connection to my family but worked with me in Sunday school to teach me the books of the Bible and God's Word and all the Bible stories that I remember. And I'm encouraged to know that there are people in this room today who my boys will look back on and remember. They'll remember learning about Moses. And maybe somebody will tell them that the magicians were named Jonas and Jambres. You wouldn't have to do that. But uh, they'll remember the kinds of things that they learn because of the tradition of truth and love that happens here. (laughs) I'm not sure why I'm tearing up here. (laughs) I don't know if it's because I'm remembering uh, the people who taught those things to me or... I'm just grateful that there are people here willing to teach them to my children. 
But either way, uh, <laughs> I'd like you to remember the weight and responsibility that we each carry to pass on that truth and to be that, uh, that person for our children and for the people who we meet here at Madison Church. Please join me in prayer. Dear God, I'm thankful for your faithfulness. I'm thankful for the faithfulness that have uh, has brought the incredible teachers and examples in my life. Teachers that uh, at the same time taught me how to drive a nail and uh, taught me about the forgiveness that comes through your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for providing those teachers for my children as well. Dear Heavenly Father, when things get tough, help me to remember not only the truth of your word, but the character of all those faithful people who taught it to me. Amen. Would you stand as we close today?